Hi, I'm Carlo with Race Walk. Thanks for joining me. And today we are going to be talking about time travel, Molinism, and the problem of evil in Now, Then, and Everyone by Rissa Walker. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk. And then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study as well as a video about books. So if you're interested in either of those things, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. So I've mentioned this book a couple times before. I mentioned, I think I mentioned it in my mid-year freakout book tag, I think. And I mentioned that it was my biggest disappointment. And you may ask, well, why are you talking about this book again if you don't like it? Well, this is the thing. I am really conflicted about this book. I really liked it to begin with. And then it just kind of took a dive, like, towards the last half. But in spite of that, it still helped give me a better understanding about the provenance of God and Molinism. So I took a class, Blame Link Craig on Molinism. But it was this book that kind of tied the pieces together for me about what I learned in that class. So a little bit about this book. This was a Kindle First selection back in March 2020, so that's how I got this. And I don't have the greatest of luck picking out Kindle First reads. A lot of the, the Kindle First books that I've gotten have been a disappointment. The reason I chose this one was because of the cover. So let's just pause for a moment and appreciate the awesomeness of this book cover. Is this not amazing? It, this is an amazing cover. This was designed by Emma's Corley. I'm going to link to their site. So if you need some art or book cover or creative work, maybe check them out because amazing cover, amazing cover. So anyway, a little bit about the book. I, I guess this is part of her Chrono series and I did read some of the other Amazon reviews and it seems like if you've read the whole story, maybe this wouldn't be as chaotic logically. I don't know. Still, there were a lot of things that were just completely a co incoherent mess. But anyway, the book has two parallel storylines. One is in 2304 and the other is 2136, and they converge in 1965. So in one timeline, Tyson Reyes is a time-traveling historian for this organization called Kronos, and they time travel to go back and observe history, but they're not allowed to do anything to change it. Now, in the other timeline, a woman named Madison Grace discovers a key that allows her to time travel. So before I talk about the parts that were really interesting to me, I'm going to talk about the, the problems that I had. And that is that in the beginning, there are all these really interesting ideas. And then it got to about half to 60% of the way through and it, it just seemed like it took this turn and went down this predictable formula of a science fiction book. There were a lot of things that came into that last half that didn't make any logical sense um, and it was so much and I, I realized that with it was any sort of fiction that you have to have suspension of disbelief but this was so extreme that I just it just I couldn't get beyond it. And the other thing too is that towards the end the story felt like it was rushed like it, it had like the editing dropped off about the last quarter like maybe they didn't have time to finish it there were things that she included in the story that if anybody had taken the time to check weren't appropriate for that time period it's just little things and I don't consider myself a nitpicky person like tell me a good story and I'll be happy but at this point the logic had went out the window and then I start noticing all these other little details. So that was my problem. But at the very beginning, I really liked it. And I thought that it could have sparked some really interesting conversations, particularly since this was in March, 2020 when it came out and it's Tyson's group is going back to observe the civil rights era. And so some of the, the things that it brought up, I thought were really interesting, particularly when you consider, you know, everything that exploded just a few months after that, I think that this was a missed opportunity. I think it could have been something significant and um, it's not. So, but we're gonna put that aside. Now I'm gonna talk about what value I did get from the book. And that is about 
how it gave me a full understanding about the providence of God. Because in Reyes's group, they have very strict standards that they have to follow. So they cannot change anything in the slightest way. And then safety checks are run through the Kronos computer afterwards to make sure that there has been no change because, and this is a quote, even a small change, some tiny wrinkle that smoothed itself out in a year or so would have earned him a, a warning. Tyson Reyes goes on an assignment to observe the civil rights era and he's, this has been what he's been doing all this time and something happens and his timeline changes. And so he has to figure out a way to fix the timeline. This is an interesting question. If the timeline had been changed, then who's to say that it needed to be fixed? And this is something that's a repeating theme throughout the book, is that something has to be allowed. So because if that thing weren't allowed, then a, a greater wrong would have happened. And so there's all these value judgments really by the historians or this organization that where they're at is the right end, right? So their timeline is right. So if anything happens that changes it from that right timeline, then it needs to be fixed. And this really speaks to the problem of evil because this book is saying that there is a right end. There is, there is an end destination that things need to work towards. And what we say as Christians is that there is a good end, but the one who decides that good end is God. And he is working all things towards that good end. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, and this ties into the foreknowledge aspect of providence, the, the people who are these time travelers have a gene that allows them the ability to time travel. And at this point, they do genetic alterings, but they have all these rules in place about how many changes and what you can change in your genes. Now, just as a side note, have you read the articles about CRISPR and the gene altering that's coming out? Really freaky, really freaky, not science fiction. This is actually happening right now. So anyway, so back to the story, but the historians who are the time travelers, this organization has decided before they were born, what assignment that they're going to be sent on and they'll make modif genetic modifications to make them fit that assignment the best, whether it's how they look, whether it's certain aptitudes or abilities, but these time travelers are foreordained to be in a specific way so that they can perform their mission most effectively. I thought that was really, really interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about Molinism and foreknowledge. So between Christians and skeptics, some of the biggest debates are between God's character and the problem of evil. Among Christians, some of the nastiest debates have to do when we talk about God's sovereignty and foreknowledge and the question of free will. So Calvinists take the position that human beings really don't have true libertarian free will, that, that God's foreknowledge means that he has already determined what any individual person will do and that everything that happens he has decided that will happen. So this simplifies the question of God's foreknowledge, his sovereignty, and what will happen, but it causes some massive problems when you're talking about God's character and the problem of evil. So what is Molinism? So it's a view of God's sovereignty that was put forward by a Jesuit priest named Louis de Molina and he was trying to reconcile this dilemma. In Molina's work, he categorizes God's knowledge as three different types. And this is a description from the site Theopedia. So natural knowledge, this is God's knowledge of all necessary and all possible truths. In this moment, God knows every possible combination of causes and effects. He knows all the truths of logic and all moral truths. The second type is middle knowledge. This is God's knowledge of what any free creature would do in any given circumstance, also known as counterfactual knowledge. It is also sometimes stated as God's knowledge of the truth of subjunctive conditionals. 
And the third type of knowledge is free knowledge. This is God's knowledge of what he freely decided to create. God's free knowledge is his knowledge of the actual world as it is. So in the most simplistic explanation, natural knowledge is what is, middle knowledge is what could be, and free knowledge is what will be. Now, the Kronos computer is actually an example of middle knowledge because it can calculate all the possible variables about what goes into causing an event to be, and it can identify the precise thing that needs to fix it. So that's an example of middle knowledge. Another example of middle knowledge is uh, you know, Paul in Dune when he goes into, um, he has kind of like that spice encounter where he transmutes it into something else, if you know what I'm talking about. And he sees, it, this opens him up and he sees to basically all knowledge about everything that will be happening and all the possible paths of where things are going to be going. It's kind of a simplistic example of middle knowledge. So the thing to remember is that the thing that the good God is working to is not here. This is not the end. And it's not like in this book, a particular timeline or particular set of circumstances. The good end that God is working towards is his eternal kingdom. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But each of us gets to choose whether we will respond to that invitation of God. And God knows in advance who will. And so he works to gather the circumstances. So all that who would and will respond under the right circumstances do. There's another thing that now, then, and everyone illustrates about God, goodness, and providence. We don't know what seemingly minor thing will lead to a good or an evil end, but God does. I've been doing Bible studies in the book of Job, and this is what God points out to Job. This is his response. Job doesn't, Job has been asking why, why God, why me? Why did you let this happen? And he really doesn't get an answer. And what God's response to him is, if you don't even understand the things that are right in front of you, then how can I possibly explain to you why? You're not God. You can possibly understand. You can't know how what is happening today is contributing to the good end that God has planned. So we may not know why a particular thing happened. We may not get an answer and we may not understand why we weren't saved from a specific thing, but God is good and he is just. And just as Job received a double blessing for his undeserved troubles, God will also treat us justly and we will receive a greater good in the end. So those are my thoughts on Now Then and Everyone by Rosa Walker. If you've watched all the way through, thank you so much. Let me know your thoughts. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. But thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.